Hi there students, it's Mr. Verzette. Today we're going to look at an environment lesson. We're going to study how environments work. I'll break down what an environment is and several fundamentals that are used to create them. To be able to do the environment lessons that I'm teaching you, you need to be proficient in these following areas. You need to be good at two-point perspective, meaning at this point it should be automatic. And I don't mean like at super, super high complex levels, but you shouldn't have to think very hard or review your notes to do basic things in two-point. You need to have a strong understanding of 3D form and volume. Perspective is everything. Whether you're drawing an animal or an environment or a spaceship or a gun, it really doesn't matter. They're just forms set in 3D space. Now volume refers to seeing your form as a three-dimensional shape. You need to have an intermediate proficiency of lighting and rendering. Intermediate meaning you're beyond the basic one, two, three read and now you're able to render without contour lines. You can also control your values so that they're balanced locally. That means that with an understanding of form and volume, you can then apply any lighting strategy to that three-dimensional form. There should be an intermediate proficiency at Photoshop. At this point, manipulating layers, transforming, lassoing, cutting, pasting, using your brush settings, your canvas settings, filters, all of that should be second nature. And finally, strong visual development skills. That refers to doing the work of a designer, having specific restrictions, finding references for those restrictions to fill your mind, and exploring a wide variety of solutions through thumbnail drawing before committing to a finished piece of artwork. So let's tackle the fundamentals. You can learn this in any fine arts class covering landscape. First thing to look at, where do you put your horizon? Well, it really depends on what your objectives are. So if your horizon, if you're short and you really want to emphasize things that are taller than you or bigger or up in the sky, then put your horizon low. That's a bug's eye view. If you want to emphasize things that you're looking down on, then put your horizon high. That shows a bird's eye view, that you're pretty tall in the shot. The horizon is where camera's at. As a beginner, a good way to start is maybe play around with different compositions with a horizon in the center, and then just explore alternatives as you go. Where do you put your VPs? Well, if you're proficient with two-point, shouldn't be an issue, but strategically, where you put your VP on the canvas can really help for drawing emphasis. So we could put a VP on the page and everything will start to converge to that area. This would be great for looking down a hallway, down an alleyway or a street, or really creating a dynamic composition where you've got this sense of convergence or speed. But I would strongly recommend that you put another vanishing point way off the page over here so that your angles look more natural. If you put your VPs, both of them, on your canvas, it's going to really look compressed and kind of weird. Another alternative you could do is to put your VPs off of the page. Again, as you space them out, your angles look a little bit more natural, and it gives you more control over where you put the focal point in the piece. It's really up to you and what your goals are. Perspective grids are tools to really help kind of make all your forms gel together so that forms are correctly put in this volume of space. I love to put the verticals in here because it helps me extract vertical forms, but it's really up to you. And I go over building a grid in an earlier video. An environment is composed of three major planes. Those planes are a foreground, a middle ground, and a background. I also have other videos on this that you're welcome to review. A foreground frames the image. It seals the composition because it's the closest to the viewer. It has a very high level of detail and it helps to establish a sense of scale in the piece. The contrast is also the boldest. You're probably gonna see your hottest whites and your darkest darks up close to you. The middle ground is the bulk of the piece. It takes up the main amount of the canvas and it's composed of the main idea or the story. It is the stage that the actors are acting on. You're probably gonna spend the most time with the middle ground. And finally, we have the background. The background does the exact same thing that the foreground does. It frames the piece, it gives a sense of depth, but it lacks the amount of detail that the foreground has. In this image, let's break down the foreground, middle ground, and backgrounds. In the foreground, we see these large alien growths that have these strange like orbs coming off of them and these little roots, all these tiny little details. And then over here in another foreground plane, which is set further back, we see the same types of little orbs repeated again. Um, so we have an establishing shot of this middle ground here. This is the stage where the main activity is happening. We've got lightning strikes and all of these uh, buildings that are overgrown with alien matter. 
And then we've got big and small little orb-like structures and clusters over here. So if we think off in the distance, here's a skyscraper. You know, these are really large egg-like things. And we can tell that they're eggs because if we look up close here, we got this jelly-like thing living in it. It's really pretty creepy. But you see how it's carefully planned to give us a sense of what things are. And then as we step further and further back into the piece, we see more of the environment. Now, in the background, we've also got hills and mountains and more buildings to give us a sense of you know how far away this is. This building can be found here and here. Plain occlusion. To occlude, that means to impede line of sight. It means you can't see behind something. Something's getting in the way. Well, because an environment is basically a sandwich of planes uh, stacked on top of each other, kind of like a pizza, if you want your environment to look really cool and have a good sense of depth, you need to have those planes interact with each other in some way. And occlusion means that portions of those planes get in the way of seeing other ones. So here in the foreground, we've got this element that passes over this middle ground element here. All right, covers it up. Over here, we have this middle ground element that covers up some of the background. Atmospheric perspective. What that means is that things that are closer to you are bolder and stronger in contrast. You're going to see bright whites. You're going to see dark darks. But things become dimmer as they get further away from you. That's because in real life, there's dust, humidity, and a lot of oxygen and nitrogen, all the things in our atmosphere between us and the thing that we're looking at. And so the more of that that's in between us and the thing that we're looking at, the less the light rays are able to reach our eye. Therefore, contrast is reduced, things start to look hazy, and they're not as clear. We can't see the details. What I did is I sampled values from the foreground, the middle ground, and the background. Right here is the foreground, and I picked the darkest and the lightest areas in here. And you can see we've got this light, kind of a evergreen type color, and then we've got like this dark, dark, almost black, okay? Now when we go to the middle ground, you're gonna notice that the lightest value got a little darker, and the darkest value got a little dimmer. Because of the color of the atmosphere, that had an impact as well. It's a blue atmosphere, and so there's a little blue added to those colors. Let's go over to the background over here. And by the way, I'm sampling trees. There are trees in the foreground, trees in the middle ground, and I can assume trees in the background. The darkest value is like slightly darker than the sky, and the lightest value is dimmer than the dark parts. So you see things shifting more to the blue here. That's called value compression. When the value scale compresses, that means your range of values are limited. So when things are far away, values compress. When things are close to you, they expand. A couple of fun tricks and techniques to do in Photoshop as you do this, I call it an atmosphere push. Others call it volumetric fog. Let's say we've got a scene like this where it's not really clearly determined what's far away and what's close yet. It's just a loose scribble, a block in. We've got some ground, we've got some framing elements like canyon walls or something. But we have this structure that's popping up, this hill. So what if we want to make two decisions? What if we want to have the hill in front of all of this? And what if we want to have the hill behind all of it? Well, we're going to use a combination of the lasso tool and a soft-edged atmosphere brush. To make the hill in front, what I do is I draw around the edges that I want to preserve or keep and then use an atmosphere brush, meaning I sample the color of the atmosphere, turn it way down, and it's a soft edge brush, and I lightly brush in some atmosphere between this pokey element and the plane behind it. And you see it gives the illusion that it's in front of us. Likewise, if I want to push the hill back, I'll draw the edge of the hill that's closer to us and then apply atmosphere to it there. And so you see, because we have bolder contrast close and we've got lighter contrast far away, it gives the illusion that this is closer to us than this. All right, foreshortening. That is in and of itself an entire lesson all alone. But suffice it to say, with an environment, wherever the horizon line is, all of the planes in your image start to compress. So if we raise horizon up near the top, the first couple of planes are going to be closer together than the remaining planes below it. As they get closer to the horizon, they're going to start to bunch up next to each other. Likewise, if we lower the horizon, everything's going to be bunched up. Here's our foreground plane, all four of them. All right. But here's also how foreshortening works with a bounding box. Let's say we're going to take this S shape, almost like a river, okay? And we want it in 3D. Well, again, use your knowledge of 
bounding box. In 3D, we could plot this form within a bounding box, find center, construct it in 3D, and after removing the bounding box, notice how the form is compressed. It looks like a river. All right, scale. Here are two ways that you can give the sense of scale in a piece. And what scale means is how your mind recognizes how big things are in relationship to each other. I put this human figure in the piece to give us a sense of scale, how big we are in relationship to this area over here. Now this figure is right next to this pillar-like rock. And you see there are a couple other pillar-like rocks that are similar, likely in shape and in size in the environment. So we know that with this little dude right here, next to this big pillar, if we were to look at this pillar off in the distance, he'd be kind of, you know, really small. If we look off to this third one over here, he'd be like a little dot, maybe not even visible. By repeating similar forms in your image at different distances, you've just created a standard of measurement for your viewer to understand what they're looking at. And then size relationships. By putting familiar sized elements into an image, you then have set a baseline for your viewer to understand how big things are in the surrounding environment. Composition means how things are put together in an image. It's foundational, meaning if you're the best drawer in the world and you've got photorealistic detail, but your piece has bad composition, the whole piece will suffer because of that. So in general, as a beginner, it's good to start with some of these guidelines. And as you become more experienced, start to expand into other areas. There are many, many, many different types of compositions, but here are a couple of tools. The first is the rule of thirds. I have videos detailing how this works, but suffice to say, in summary, wherever a major focal point lands, whenever it lands on one of these intersections, they found that the brain gets more active when it looks at images like that. It sees this as an interesting piece. So you want to shoot for, in general, no more than two major focal points on the rule of thirds grid. And you see here, one focal point is going to be this big mass of tentacles coming towards these soldiers, and the other focal point is going to be the soldiers shooting at the monster. All right, another one, movement and flow. What that is, is how you guide the eye throughout the piece. You want to have a payoff for a focal point, and the focal point is going to be where these two opposing forces are clashing. And see these little arrows? Uh, you can guide the eye in a number of ways. One of the major ones is, is just point them to where you want them to look using the elements that you've generated. So all these tentacles are moving in this direction. So naturally, our eye is going to want to follow that path and say, hey, where's it going? Right? All right? These soldiers are also looking to the left and firing to the left. So if we look over here, we're going to want to think, oh, hey, let's look this way. Right? So if we look down here in the corner, we are on the edge of like this crater-like depression in the ground, and it slopes, so that's going to move our eye back to the tentacles. If we move up here into the corner in this area, we've got these clouds that can pull us back, and then the barrel guns of these tank-like objects pointing to pull us back down into the action. Or if we move up, the clouds can pull us back to the tentacles, right? So you're constantly cycling through. You're trying to find ways to control where the viewer's eye goes. Other ways you can control where the eye goes is, you know, shiny things. We're attracted to bright and dark, so strong areas of contrast. So, you know, bright, shiny. Um, areas where there's lots of clusters of activity next to areas where there's not much activity. That's another thing that will draw the eye. And then think of like the, the pattern that the flow takes. Uh, one of the most common forms is a triangular bounce where the eye goes throughout the piece. So for example, let's look at the soldier. We can either go to the left where he's looking or we can go down based on the angle of the shot. And then when we get down here, we've got this mass of tentacles pulling us over here to the right. So it makes a triangular pattern. There are many different shapes that you can use. There are radial patterns, there are L shapes, zigzags, look them up and see which ones would help you in your composition. But before I painted, I had this generally in mind, and then I continued to tweak it as I worked. I was not focusing on, oh, does the soldier look good? Because the painting's not done yet. It's still being blocked in. I was focusing on, does the composition work? Is it stable? And then, once all those elements are in place, then you focus on details and all the little things. So here's another composition trick. This is called emphasis, or another term in design, dominance. Emphasis means that certain things are more important than others. 
They all have a place, yet they should have a hierarchy of importance, similar to the military. You've got lots of grunt soldiers, but only a few officers. Not all elements within a composition are of equal importance. And so what I did is I made a couple direct flaws on this composition. And you can see right here that one of them is that this pillar-like element shares the same height as this guy over here. Another is that this figure that we placed here sits within the bounds of this space right here, right? He doesn't really stand on his own. He stands on his own in relationship to this guy. See how he extends past it? He occludes it. But this little dude, he's submissive to it. I would say that this figure is an important element and should have more emphasis. So I've got two solutions. Generally in your work, one way we could solve the figure issue would be to just shift him over a little bit. Now you see how the figure occludes multiple planes. He goes over the foreground and the middle ground and he also extends a little ways outside of the bounds of this pillar here. So he stands on his own and also interacts a little bit. He's a lot more visible now. Now the issue with sharing height, that goes back to kind of, you know, subconscious thinking. Things that are larger are more imposing than us, and typically we associate height and size with strength and authority. Just look at a king. Their throne is usually elevated. Look at a judge. Their bench is usually elevated in the courtroom. Likewise, things that are important should probably have different elevations. If something is of the same height as another, it subconsciously will feel a little off. So what I did is I shrunk down the size of this pillar and raised up the size of this one. So they no longer share the same height. So how exactly do you paint an environment? Well, I'm not really going to get into how to control your brush or any of that stuff. That's outside the scope of this. But in general, going back to even traditional painting, it's generally recommended that if you're going to create an environment, start from the back and work your way up to the front when you're blocking in most of your major forms. So for example, if we were going to make this uh, beach scene, step one would be to create a nice little orange to yellow gradient and then maybe even combine step one and step two by dropping in um, the ocean. All right? And that would fill up the entirety of the canvas. And then uh, just like a slice of pizza, you know, what do you have on top of your crust with sauce? And then after the sauce, cheese. You, know, you would apply the beach shape, painting over the top of that ocean that you painted. A lot of times in painting, stuff goes away when you paint over the top of it. That's no big deal, it's just the process. Next, you would do the things that rest on the beach. Also, um, these clouds are behind the trees. So we would actually want to do those first, and then the trees. And then after the trees are blocked in, your camp composition is basically uh, finished. You can focus on detailing. And then the way that you apply your paint is no different than if you're just going to render any form. You know, whatever those trees look like, think about how they exist in 3D space. Do a 1, 2, 3 read. So apply lighting to those things. Follow the stroke directions. Use a variety of colors. And then you've got yourself a quick little render. It's important to remember the general workflow of digital painting. The largest gains of your piece will take place in the earliest amount of time. 80% of your painting will become visible in the first 20% of the time. The remaining 80% of the time is spent polishing, detailing, refining, cleaning. For example, if you look at this image, I started with a line drawing and then a uh, block in and then refined those. And if we zoom into the block in, you see there's really not any information in here. It's just jagged strokes. But after logging the 80% of the time, then all the elements start to take form and the piece starts to pay off. So there's a lot of patience associated with this. Likewise, with still life or fruit, the same process. You block in your fruit and immediately your forms read, your lighting reads, colors, all of that. Um, and then you start to clean and detail and polish. And there's really not much of a difference between this and this. There's a major difference between this and then nothing. See what I mean? So. Um, so the same thing with an environment. To get better at environments, I would just say do a lot of them. And you can see again how perspective is key. Do lots of little thumbnail sketches and they don't even have to make sense to the average viewer. I mean, these could be mountains, these could be buildings, uh, but play with camera angle, play with positioning, play around with composition. Get good at drawing a lot of things at low detail very efficiently, you know, hammer out one and then move on to the next and the next and make each one different from the other and they don't again about making sense 
I mean, this thumbnail should look pretty familiar based on what you guys just saw. This is the thumbnail sketch that I used to create this. See? I just flipped it to the left. And the composition was pinned down early with this loose sketch. So fun exercises to do, lots of drawing. Let's look at another one that's a hoot as well. I like to call it finding the extraordinary in the ordinary. Here's a picture of just a normal camera. Find some images on the web of average everyday objects and with the knowledge of extracting perspective and grids like you have seen in previous videos, uh, could we take this and using your imagination convert it into something interesting that's not a camera? Well, when I was looking at it, I thought, man, that looks like a big orbital defense cannon. So using the perspective, we could paint over that using those forms, control our own lighting, drop in our own horizon line, and then build off of these elements. You know, just for like a fun, quick sketch. And if you had the time, you can go in and uh, detail this out, drop in a lot of other technical skills on it, like photo textures, post-processing, you know, really refine things and spend like 20 hours on a painting to get it rendered out. But this is a great way to come up with um, uh, original ideas using environments. So you can see it doesn't matter what the elements are, they're just forms in 3D space that are lit with an understanding of volume and light and shadow. I hope you guys have found this helpful. Look forward to seeing you in class. Take care.